It's good to be able to be here with all of you. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic. We have been working this uh, week very hard on improving our abilities to transmit the mass. It's been a, quite a journey because we uh, had uh, slow internet. So uh, it's, um, it's been quite a journey in order to improve the internet connection. We had to drill through the walls in order to improve the connection here. So thank you so much for your patience. I'm so grateful. Uh, uh, we're this week going to purchase uh, cameras and uh, set ourselves up to be able to uh, transmit the mass uh, much better to all of you. But we've improved the internet connection, so that's a good thing, uh, even though high-speed internet is not available in this area. Uh, but during these days, many of you are enclosed at home with your loved ones. You are enclosed there uh, at home with your loved ones, and you have somebody there with you. Well, I've been by myself. And let me tell you, there is a reason why priests used to have housekeepers. That's not so much the case anymore, but... There is a reason why priests would have housekeepers, and it wasn't because they couldn't cook or clean. As you have found out, if you follow me on Facebook, I, I can even make tamales, and that is not easy work, okay? That is very hard. So I can, I can do my own cooking, I can do my own cleaning, but that's not the reason why priests would have uh, housekeepers. It was for company. And usually they would be older women if there was a younger priest because, uh, you know, you want to avoid always uh, the gossip as people oftentimes don't have anything to gossip about. So they like to gossip about the life of the priest, especially in a small town. You know how it is in a small town. I found that out many times living in small towns. Small town equals a lot of times big hell because of the gossip and the rumors and everything that goes around. So let me just tell you that uh, it was like that with Father O'Connor. Father O'Connor had a housekeeper and her name was Mrs. McGillicuddy. And she lived with him. And every time something would break in the home, she would run to him and she'd say, Father O'Connor, the roof is leaking, she'd say. Your roof is leaking. Father O'Connor, your roof is leaking. Your stove is broken. If the stove was broken or if your refrigerator was broken, she would run to him and she'd say, Father O'Connor, your refrigerator is broken. And he got tired of it. He says, Mrs. McGillicuddy, this is just as much your house as my house. Next time something isn't right, something is broken or there is a problem, don't come running to me and saying that it's your refrigerator or your uh, roof or your stove. Say our refrigerator, our stove, our roof. And so one day the bishop is visiting with uh, some other priests and Mrs. McGillicuddy runs in all frantic into the dining room and says, oh, frantic, Father O'Connor, Father O'Connor, there's a mouse under our bed. <laughs> well, I hope that that got you laughing today. Uh, it's good to have joy in our life. Joy is the gift of the Lord in our life. And during this time, we have to rediscover our joy. The joy of the Lord in our lives. This particular passage has three of the most heartbreaking words in the entire Bible that I just read to you. The road to Emmaus, in my opinion, has the three most heartbreaking words in the Bible. We were hoping. 
the two on the road to Emmaus. And we are all on the road to Emmaus ourselves. It's the road of life. We are all sojourning. We are all journeying. And they say the three most heartbreaking words we were hoping. Two disciples were walking away from Jerusalem, downcast, all buried up and say, we were hoping. Isn't it like that now? We were hoping this economy would, would continue like it was. We were hoping that the upward trend in my life would be continuing. We were hoping that there wouldn't be any disaster in your own life. So often when you get down, you can say, I was hoping my health would continue the way it was. And boom, you get diagnosed with cancer. I was hoping my marriage would continue the way it was. And boom, cheating happens or a divorce happens. I was hoping my kids would continue their life like they were. And then you find out they're addicted to drugs. I was hoping, you say. We were hoping. It's like that in our life. Jesus' words made these two, when they were walking with him, dream of a new life. And his miracles filled them with hope that just maybe, maybe God would finally fulfill his promises. That just maybe God would end this Roman occupation that they were under. That just maybe the violence would stop that just maybe the hunger would stop, that just maybe the world would be different. And don't we often find ourselves like that ourselves? Saying, I was hoping that the world would finally be better. No more violence, no more disease, no more depression, no more anxiety, no more oppression, no more war, no more violence, no more child abuse. No more sexual abuse of people. No more rape. No more fear. No more betrayal. Don't we often find ourselves like that? And then what happens? Boom. The crucifixion happens. The death of their hope happened. As often happens in our life too. When you are faced with the death of a loved one. You've been married for 50 years. And all of a sudden, boom. Your hope dies, a disease or a pandemic. How many people find themselves hopeless right now? They say that one of the results of this particular pandemic, coronavirus pandemic that is going on is that suicide rates are on the rise. Depression is on the rise. Fear is on the rise. Hope has died for many people. The crucifixion happens in all of our lives. We were hoping, they said. We had hoped. Notice the grammar. The verb is in the past tense. Their hoping was in the past. Apparently the dreams Jesus unleashed, unleashed in them weren't coming through. They were not coming true. The night came, in other words. The night came in their life. But the Bible says in Psalm 30, Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. So while I cannot control the coming of the night, you could not have controlled that this coronavirus happened. It just happened. Like the night just comes. You're in the day. And the night comes. You cannot control the night. But you can manage what you do during the night. You can manage your reaction to the night. You can't control when it comes. Darkness just shows up. I can't control when I'm coming out of it. We don't have any power to control when this coronavirus thing will be over. Some nights last longer than others. Like sometimes, you know, your cancer will last, to get over it is going to last longer. For some people, it's years. 
Grief, to get over it, takes time. You can't control the coming of the night, but you can control how you act in the night. That while I am going through it, I can control my reaction. Notice the Bible in Psalm 30, David told us, weeping may endure for the night. What is that? That's the key word there. May. The, the translation of the Bible. And I checked out so many translations. And it is may. It says may. Weeping may endure for the night. It doesn't say weeping will endure for the night. It says may. The Bible says you gotta weep. Yeah. So many of us are crying right now and you've cried before in your life and you will cry again. That's how it is. It's called life. Okay? But you have the power to control how you act in the night. While, yeah, it moves you to tears. It doesn't have to move you to tears during the entire night. The whole experience of the night doesn't have to be crying yeah, there has to be joy. We are people of the resurrection, not people of the crucifixion. Joy has to mark our life. The night will last, but weeping doesn't have to last. You don't have to cry your way through the night. You don't have to complain your way through the night. You don't have to be depressed through the night. Yeah, depression comes and goes, you know, it's like that. You know, but it doesn't have to be forever. You don't have to be discouraged the entire experience of the night. You don't have to fear the entire night. You see, is it's possible to weep through the night, but you don't have to. You understand that? It says weeping may. It's my choice whether I will weep. We are our own worst enemies each one of us, by what we tell ourselves and what we believe, by the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves, about the world, about our family, about the situation we find ourselves in. Your disposition is up to you. How you are going to act in the night of this coronavirus, that's up to you. The devil is not in control. God is. Weeping may endure for the night. May. You see, if you only see in the Bible the fact that your struggle or problem is time, you are missing a wonderful revelation and concept of our faith. I am tired of people just being focused on the fact that at some point this is going to end. Stop. You know, I... I'm tired of hearing this. Oh, we, there's light at the end of the tunnel. We're going to get through this. That's focusing on the end. That's where the problem comes in. We have to live through this. Not that it's going to end. Yeah, everybody knows it's going to end. But what are you doing in the meantime? All depressed? Suicidal? What am I going to do? Is your focus the end? Because that's what the world is telling us right now. And many preachers, many messages out there, it's all about, you got to focus on the end. The, the morning is coming. That's not what Psalm 30 says. Yeah, of course the morning is coming. But it says weeping may endure for the night. Are you weeping the night out? It's not easy. Of course it isn't. Do you think it's easy to be a priest with an empty church? You know, you think it's easy? You know, the bills keep coming, everything. You think it's easy to make tamales and holy packets and then have to listen about people complaining about what they got in their holy packet? Oh, Father, you sent me a, a small candle. I wanted a big one. I wanted a big one. I, don't, I wanted a big one and I wanted a, a, a thick one, they said. I didn't want this small little candle you sent. And you only sent me a little bit of exercise, uh, exercise salt and a little bit of holy water. What do you want me to send you? A gallon? 
And then the other people complaining about, you know, it's been two weeks and I haven't gotten mine. What do you think? I'm Amazon Prime? You think that I'm Amazon Prime? I mean, come on. <laughs> Where's your patience? Do you think it's easy to be at home all by myself? But then, you know, we have to focus on the joys. I get myself busy doing things for all of you, like on Facebook, like making tamales, like creating holy packets and sending them out. Believe me, when they see me in the post office, the, the, those people want to weep because <laughs> they have to weigh each one individually. <laughs> I mean, we the best way to get through your depressed feeling or feeling down is to get yourself busy doing things for other people. Yep. You know, I mean, you could focus on all the all bad that's going on. I'm right now, I'm focused on the high that I'm having, which is this beautiful whole... A living spirit choir music group that made that drove all the way from the Santa Rosa area to be here today and that are gracing me. This is the first time I've had music in English and not just any music, but like the best ever. And I'm focused on that. See, you can focus on all the bad stuff that's going on. I could focus on the fact that I don't have my people. I could focus on all that's going on. But no, you got to see, it's the story you tell yourself. I, the stories you tell yourself make you weep and then it endures for the night. But if you tell yourself a different story, the story of faith, a positive story, it just may be, it will be a maybe. May, uh, may. It ain't forever, you know, in perpetuity. That's one of those University of Chicago words, okay? It ain't perpetual, okay? It ain't forever. It may. You see, if you only see in the Bible the fact that your struggle or problem is timed, you are missing a wonderful revelation in our concept of faith. We are not about waiting and weeping while we are going through something. I'm not focused so much on when it will end. That ain't my focus. I'm focused on right now because I got to live right now. It's going to end, of course, but what am I doing right now? It's not about crying and weeping as you struggle. You don't have to weep as you struggle. Of course, everybody struggles. May means it's possible for anything to happen during the night. I may smile. I may laugh, but that's my choice huh? during the night. I may have joy during the night. huh? Look the devil in the face and say, you will not mess up my night. I am looking you right in the face and I'm going to tell you, you will not mess up my night. I'm in the night experience, but I will not let you mess up my night experience. This is going to be the best night experience of my life. That's the attitude that you have to have. You look the devil in your fa in his face. He ain't more powerful than God. He's a liar. Even in the night, God's got you in his hands. All night, he's got angels watching over you. Isn't that what our faith says? Now, these two on the road to Emmaus lost their hope. But what happened to them? And this is the most powerful. See, I always like to leave the best for last. Okay? What's the most, what, what happens to them? They lost their hope. And what happens on the road to Emmaus? Hope finds them. Jesus finds them. He is the hope and he finds them. They don't find hope. Hope finds them. Are you understanding this? Because a lot of you are always, Father, my children, what's going to happen to them? They don't go to church anymore. They don't want to practice their faith. What's going to happen? Look at my, my, my husband. Father, what, what's going to happen? You know, and it's God finding us. It's not us finding God. Jesus said that very powerfully. It's not you who have chosen me, but it's I who have chosen you. From the very beginning in the Bible, in the prophet Jeremiah tells us, 
Even before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you, I dedicated you. A prophet to the nations, I appointed you. So special are his children to him, the Bible teaches us. Your children are in God's hands and he's after them as he was after Mary, who didn't go after God. God went after her. Joseph didn't go after looking to be the foster parent of, of Jesus. God went after him. The apostles didn't go after Jesus. He found them. Paul was found by God. Yes. And so will your children in whatever situation they find themselves in, God is after them. God is searching for them. The Bible is full of that. From the very beginning of the Bible, it's not we who choose God, it's God who chooses us. So stop, you know, stop with all this telling your children so much about God because you think you're going to tell them something. You know, I got to tell them something. Spend less time, or I should say spend no time, telling your children about God if they are out in the world, especially those who are uh, away from your home. Spend less time talking to them about God and faith and spend more time talking to God about your children. Huh? Maybe you should stop pestering your husband a little, okay, about all these things and pester more the Lord. Or are you more powerful than God? If God can move mountains, he can move little human hearts. The Bible is full of that. These two saw hope die, but hope came back and found them when they felt lost. Do you understand why your children need to get lost? Some of you, you know, you fear your children getting lost. In order to be found, I got to get lost. Huh? In order for hope to be able to find me, you got to get lost first. Can't get up unless you fall down. Can't do it. The only way to get up is to fall down. So you understand now why you got to let the people in your life go through the motions and you have to go as well. It's not you who have chosen me, but I who have chosen you. When hope is lost, then boom. What happens? Like on the road to Emmaus. What happens? Boom! Hope finds us like it is finding you right now. You know, it's not a coincidence you're listening to me right now. You may be all there enclosed and you find yourself, you stumbled upon this mass. Oh yeah, that's why I told you to share this mass because it's powerful. God's word is powerful. We're rediscovering the power of the word of God in our lives. God is speaking to you right now. You are, you are at the right place at the right time because it's the place God wants you to be. That's why I told you to share this and later on share this mass because we want people to be filled with hope. Because when I am down and oh my soul so weary, when trouble comes, what happens? Then in the silence, Hope comes and finds me and sits a while with me. I am sitting with all of you right now. And Jesus is sitting right there where you're at. And Living Spirit Choir is here to sit with you in music and to let you know that you are not alone. God is with you. He's sitting there with you. He is looking for you. He's been searching. All you got to do is recognize it. These two felt unfulfilled, but he filled them with new life. He filled them with new fuel, new gas. Huh? He gave them new fuel, much better than anything they're inventing today in terms of gasoline. You know what my gas is? It ain't the 90, N95 or whatever else. My gas is Jesus. You don't have to complete every project, you know, like, oh, what's going to happen? You don't have to get it all done, done. You don't have to get all your work done. You don't have to finish all your tasks. You don't have to be the best parent or the best worker or the best wife. You don't have to be the best cook. No, or the best husband. Because as I heard when I was being ordained and this past, uh, this past, uh, 
Thursday was 11 years that I was ordained a deacon. I put up a picture. Also on my YouTube page is the entire video of my ordination. It's absolutely beautiful. You should go to my YouTube page and watch it and subscribe to the YouTube page too because all my videos are on there. That I I work very hard on these things. So the least you could do is watch them and also uh, share them. You, I would love for you to do that. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel. But make a long story short, this past Thursday, it was hard because this weekend I was supposed to be in Poland. Yeah, I was supposed to be in Poland. I was supposed to be in Poland eating uh, my grandmother's pierogi, pierogi and eating my favorite blood sausage. I love blood sausage. It's called kiszka or uh, kashanka. Depends on where you're from in Poland. But I think a lot of you, you call it kiszka. I just love kiszka with little pieces of uh, kidney, cubed kidneys in there and cubed uh, liver. Oh, it's delicious. I, <laughs> just thinking about it. I, we, I mean, they had already killed the pigs for the party. I mean, this was going to be like the second coming. <laughs> I'm serious. You know, the ducks were killed for the charnina, the soup, the duck blood soup. Oh, it's just delicious. That's why I could not be a Jehovah Witness. Okay. I could not. Because, <laughs> you know, they, they take the Bible literally. So they... They take out a phrase from the Bible that says, you know, you're not, because the Jews would believe that life was in the blood. That's why they can't, that's why like if their kids get sick, they can't have a blood transfusion. But anyway, uh, I'm getting off topic as I usually can. The people who come to church normally know that. But uh, anyhow, uh, this past Thursday was very hard. I was ordained a deacon 11 years ago. And in May, by the way, you know, I posted something about my deacon ordination and very few people greeted me that day because I was checking it, okay? But don't worry, May 22nd is my priestly ordination and this year it's 10 years, okay? 10 years, that's why I was going back to Poland because it's my 10th anniversary. So you still have a chance to redeem yourself May 22nd, okay? <laughs> uh, but, at the deacon ordination, I heard these words and they've been resonating with me. From Philippians, first chapter, verse six. Philippians one, verse six. Chapter one, verse six. That's the letter to the Philippians, not to the Filipinos. Okay, because some of you are looking in your Bible and you're saying, where is, you know, I'm, I want my Filipinos. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay, that's Philippians. And it says, be confident of this, that he who began the good work in you will carry it to completion. That's the ending verse of the deacon ordination. The, the bishop said that. He who began the good work in you will bring it to fulfillment, will bring it to completion. Who's Finishing the work in us. Me? No, God is. So I don't have to get it all right because he's getting it all right in me. And I need to remember that more and more, particularly during this time. I've been so frustrated with trying to get this uh, camera system set up and, you know, not being able to get high speed internet, drilling, spending so much money, now having to purchase all these cameras and everything. You know, it's a, it's a, we're a small town. You know, small church, it's not that easy as you can imagine. And so I just got, I have to keep telling myself all the time, I am not the Messiah. There was one, his name was Jesus Christ. And I can only do what I can do. And as long as I do my best, which is what I have been doing, praise the Lord. Huh? Because he who has begun the good work is finishing it. He is redeeming us. God is our redeemer. And what does the word redeemer mean? He's changing us. He's not rescuing us. God is not our rescuer. God is our redeemer. You see, like a lot of you, you like to think of God as this helicopter pilot. And boom, you're in this coronavirus mess and that he's going to come and take you out. No, 
The Bible doesn't say that. He says, when I am down and in trouble, he comes to me when I'm in trouble. Not when I'm out of trouble. He comes to me when I am in trouble. So God, I like to think of God as this. I like to think of God as uh, the midwife. And I've been in, in, in hospital rooms where uh, the woman is giving birth. I've been in hospital rooms because I was waiting for the baby to be born so I could baptize it right away because it was in danger of dying. But anyhow, uh, some of you might say to yourself, oh, Father Adam, he looks so innocent. You know, he's so young and all that. He doesn't know anything. Listen, I've seen it all. Okay, lest you think that I haven't seen it all. <laughs> I've seen it all. And when there in this in the room for waiting for the baby to be born, the woman is in a lot of pain. And she's like, she's screaming, you know, and all that. And what is the midwife telling her? What does she say? Push, push. And the woman's like, I can't, I can't. Push, push. This one time I was in there, this one lady, she looked at her husband. Because it's, 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 it's scary. You know, and she looked at her husband and she says, this is all because of you. <laughs> it's like, it's all your fault. Isn't that what we want to do right now too? A lot of times we like to find somebody to blame. Who's to blame for this coronavirus thing? Who's to blame? Nobody. It just happens. Life happens. Life is tough. Huh? What are we going to do? Bury our heads in the sand or look that God is redeeming the situation, changing the situation. And he's right there beside us saying, push, push. You can do it. And when you focus on that, you can have a smile on your face as you're pushing. So I got to tell you, push. Today, the Lord is saying to you, let me do the work for you and in you. I'm with you and in you. And I'm helping you push. You will only be complete when you let me complete you. Huh? Let me embrace you in my love. Let me sit by you. Let me find you. We are never ready, you know. We are never ready for the stuff that comes in our life. Like how many of you were ready for this coronavirus pandemic? I wasn't. I mean, if I was, I'd have a whole camera system set up. You know, and everything would be just wonderful. But no, who was ready? Don't we want to, Don't. but don't we have to be ready? We don't have to be ready because in order to find God, because God finds us. You don't have to have it all figured out or have it all in place and always be ready because God always finds you. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up on stormy seas. You raise me up. So I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. Yes, he raises us up. And Tweez sings that way better than me, of course. I, but he raises us up. You can find it later on in YouTube. Josh Groban, you raise me up and listen to it. I love that song. And how do we find that person who raises us up? Who raises you up? Who gives us hope? How do you find him? How do you find hope? You don't! Hope finds you as it has found you right now. The razor upper finds you. The razor upper. When I am down and all my soul so weary, when trouble comes and my heart burdened be, then I am still and wait here in the silence until you come, you come huh? and sit a while with me. Until you come and sit a while with me. The one who raises you up, the risen one, he is the riser. He is the one who rose, has come to raise us up. Now, hallelujah to raise us up, to pick you up.
in the silence to sit with us, to give you hope and to raise you to newness, to newness of life. Amen.